All right, good morning, church family. I want to ask you to take a Bible, turn to the ninth Psalm. Our text this morning will be Psalm 9, so go ahead and turn there. And when you find your way there, I want to also ask you to take the worship folder that I hope you received on your way in. First things first, I want to ask us to take our Connect card out, the insert in the worship folder. If you're a guest of ours, we want to welcome you to Chapin Baptist Church. Uh, We're so glad that you've joined us in our worship gathering. We'd love to get acquainted if you need a church family. So would you please consider putting your information on the front of this card? And then for everybody, as always, even if we're in a new building, we're going to still ask, how can we pray for you and your family this week? So go ahead and let us know how we can be praying. Fill out your prayer request here. If you have a sensitive request, there's this box right here at the bottom you can check. And that request will go only to elders and pastors. I do want to make sure that you are aware of a few things uh, in this new setting for the next few weeks. If you haven't already found the restrooms, they're located to my left, your right. If you just went out through this this entrance here, you'd find them in the back wall of the main lobby out there. Uh, You may also have found the coffee being served in what we call the Cornerstone Cafe right through here. Information table is located in the lobby as well, and there are some other things that you can get acquainted with. We still have our mission, uh, ministry information tables out here as well, so we are glad to be able to worship here. Mac, you said it very well. Thank you for saying that. We are blessed to be here. Uh, I do want you to know, if you're new, wondering what's going on, why did I just go to the back part of the the property here? Uh, We are getting some things worked on in our main worship center. And so this is the first Sunday that we've gathered in here, uh, and it's great to be here. I do want you to thank a staff member when you see them over the next few weeks. Our staff has been amazing to work very hard, to work together. Uh, I'm so thankful for uh, all of the effort put into this. And I want to tell you, on top of just the effort being put into it, we just seize this as an opportunity. Okay, we wouldn't have preferred to have to do this, but we realized, hey, this is an opportunity. God's got us experiencing this for some reason, so let's try to do the best we can. So I'm very, very thankful uh, to be here worshiping this morning. Let me also point out a few things in our bulletin. Please read through it if you have not already. I do want to make some things kind of highlighted as far as pertinent dates. Today, there is a meeting for anyone interested in Uh, The Builders for Christ mission trip coming up in July, so please read the information about that. If you're interested, you can learn a lot more in the meeting today at 1215 in the Cornerstone Cafe. Again, that's right through this little foyer here into where they're serving coffee. Also want to make sure everybody knows that the car show is Saturday, April 20. That is Saturday, right? What is today? Sunday. Today is Sunday. All right, 16th. April 22nd, that's Saturday coming up, the car show, so be in prayer about that. We hope to be able to continue to forge good relationships with those in our community, have a good time, and just begin to kind of pre-evangelize, plant some gospel seeds. I also want to highlight the Next Steps luncheon coming up next Sunday, April 23rd. Now, what is this about? If you need a church family, maybe you've been visiting here for a while, uh, maybe this is your first Sunday, you need a church family, you'd like to learn a little bit more about Chapin Baptist, That's what these Next Step luncheons are for. Uh, I would love for you to consider coming. You can sign up by contacting the church office there. We look forward to having a good time. It's just simply an opportunity to get a little orientation about who we are. Uh, It'll be a very simple gathering and worthwhile. And then ladies, just be aware that Saturday, April 29th, coming up in a couple weeks, you'll have your Saturday sunrise gathering, women's breakfast. Uh, So be aware of that. And then also salt lunch coming up Wednesday, April 26th. Like I said, read through all those other matters. Uh, There may be helpful information for a variety of reasons, so go ahead and check into all that. Now, what I want to go ahead and do, normally I read through the text and pray, but I want to pray first. So I want to ask you to bow your heads. Let's ask God to bless the preaching of his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. And God, I, I want to add my prayer to Matt's prayer and to Max's prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you for gathering, gathering us right here. Lord, we can celebrate in your sovereignty and in your providence that this is where you want us. And I celebrate that. Lord, I thank you for that. We praise you for that. 
God, we thank you even more for the opportunity to bring Bibles, to open up Bibles, to look at what we believe to be your living and active word. And so we thank you for these moments. And God, I pray that you would foster worship among us while we worship over your word. I pray, Lord, that you would regenerate dead souls, Lord, people who need to hear the gospel and respond to that. Would you quicken their spirits, bring them to the light and life of the gospel? God, I pray that we would respond in praise and in prayer. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll be honest, it took a while with this chapter. What I mean by that is I, I didn't see the sermon coming together maybe as quickly as I'm used to. I just want you to know that because I am very excited to share what the Lord eventually did give me. I certainly hope it comes across well. And one of the things that I want you to understand is what we learn in the inscription. It says, to the choir master, according to, I'll pronounce that Hebrew phrase, mut leben, a psalm of David. Now, what I want you to know is that phrase translated is death of a son. So we're reading an inscription of Psalm 9 that says this is according to Death of a son, a psalm of David, which is very intriguing because beginning in Psalm 3 and then for the next several weeks up until today, we've had a backdrop to these psalms. The backdrop is the revolt of one of David's sons, Absalom, who eventually died as a result of the revolt. So King David had to celebrate a victory which came about through the death of his son. I don't know that we can imagine the conflicting emotions, the conflicting thoughts being represented in this psalm. I want you to know what my appeal to you is this morning. I, I finished my prayer with what is essentially my appeal to you as a church family it's let's praise God this morning, and let's pray to God this morning. That's what we see happening in this psalm. I believe that's what this psalm is encouraging us to do. In other words, what the Holy Spirit wants us to do in response to his word. Let's praise God, and let's pray to God, and let's do so even through our own conflicting emotions, are our own conflicting thoughts. Maybe our conflict isn't as severe as David's was in this moment in history. But I bet you carried some, some things in with you this morning. I want you to be able to praise God even through those, to pray to him even through those. Look at verse one and two. I want you to hear emphatic praise. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. If you would humor me, let me read those two verses again and extra emphasize what David is saying. He says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. That is emphatic praise. He says, I will recount all of your wonderful deeds, not just some. No, he's more emphatic than that. He's going to recount all of God's wonderful deeds. He says, I will be glad and exult in you. Like being glad in you wasn't enough. No, David wanted to emphasize, I will be glad and exult in you. He says, I will sing praise to your no your name, O oh, Most High. This song gets going with emphatic praise, kind of like our service did this morning. Blessed assurance, praising my Savior all the day long. But let's be honest. We don't always feel like that, do we? 
I'm not sure we could ever sing that song without lying just a little bit. We don't always feel like we want to praise God with our whole heart. We don't always want to recount all of God's wonderful deeds knowing we could never even count them all. We don't always feel glad in the Lord. We're not always exulting in the Lord. And while we may be able to say in agreement that he is God most high, we may not always be celebrating that. What I, what I want us to see is that David moves on to give us premises for praise. Beginning in verse 3, he provides four premises for our praise. I want you to just walk through verses 3 through 12 with me. In verse 3 and 4, the first premise for our praise is that God is a just judge. David celebrates, when my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence, for you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. We can praise God because he is a just judge. We can also praise God because the enemy has been ended. Look at verse five and six. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. So you can praise God this morning because God is a just judge. You can praise God this morning because the enemy has been ended. Third, you can praise God because he is the eternal king. Look at verse 7 and 8. But the Lord, so in contrast to the wicked, the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. He judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people's with uprightness. So God is a just judge. The enemy has been ended. God is the eternal king. And fourth, God is our stronghold. Look at verse 9 and 10. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. So there we have it. David has provided four premises for praise. Hear them again. God is a just judge. The enemy has been ended. God is the eternal king and God is our stronghold. Now we need to imagine after verse 10 and before verse 11, imagine in parentheses the word therefore. Therefore in light of these reasons to praise God, verse 11 says, Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. I want us to sing praises to the Lord this morning for the same reasons that David was able to sing praises to him. But we need to contend with our conflictions. I don't want us to say let's praise the Lord with a surface statement. I don't want us to say, let's praise the Lord and be flippant about it, dishonest about it. No, I want to encourage those of us in here who are having a very difficult time feeling like you can praise the Lord. You're conflicted. And I just want you to know, I get it. Be encouraged that God's word is encouraging us to examine our own possible internal conflicts through which he wants us to be able to praise him. Let's contend with our conflictions just thinking about the text. One challenge we have responding to this psalm is that none of us is a king. You're not a king dealing with nations. 
So in a very real way, you and I can't relate to King David. You're not going to get up tomorrow morning and reconvene your court and lay down laws for the land. No, you're going to be doing good to get up after the first or second time you've hit the snooze button, kind of wander into the shower, get cleaned up, and try to get as spruced up as you can, probably eat a very uninspiring breakfast, maybe get the kids up for school, chase down the bus if you have to. Some of you will get in the car, and you'll commute to the same office. Some of you may go on an exercise, and you know what? Good for you. I hope you feel proud of yourself. Some of you will start to clean up the house, doing it all over again, right? Monday is tomorrow. You're not a king. How are we supposed to relate to this text? Perhaps even more significant, a challenge that we have responding to Psalm 9, that there is still so much injustice staring us in the face. There is still so much defeat that we can feel in life. Defeats of a variety of kinds. There is still so much oppression. There's still so much trouble. What I'm trying to do is give you an opportunity to be like, okay, Michael, great. You can point out from the text that God is a just judge and that the enemy will be defeated and that God is the king on the throne and that he is our stronghold. But I'm allowing you to acknowledge to yourself, but there's still so much trouble. Some of you are dealing with major trouble. Maybe some of you are dealing with smaller troubles. I had trouble sleeping last night. And I know in those moments I'm supposed to be thankful for an opportunity to maybe have some more prayer and praise. Man, that's what I'm going to preach on anyway. Do you think I did much praise and prayer? I tried. I pitched more of a fit than I praised. I don't care if your troubles are small or if they're huge. I want you to be able to acknowledge them to yourself this morning and know that God still wants you to be able to praise him. Matter of fact, you can often feel forsaken. I know we're told in Psalm 9 verse 10, you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you, but I want to give you the opportunity to admit to God and yourself that you may often feel forsaken. Matter of fact, it often feels like the enemies are alive and well. And with that thought, I want you to come back next week. Psalm 10 deals with that. Let's go ahead and contend with our internal conflictions. But I do want you to hear some hints of hope from the text. Profound hints of hope. Jesus can relate. I want you to think about this. Jesus can relate to King David and all of David's praise. And Jesus can relate to you and me and all of our problems. I want you to look at verse 10 and verse 12 with me. Those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Look at verse 12. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. I want you to appreciate that compared to verses 10 and 12, Jesus sounded pitiful. Here's why I say this. Because in Matthew chapter 27, As Jesus is hanging on a cross, he cries out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then we're told that he cries out again. And with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. 
He didn't sound like Psalm 9, verse 10. You, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. No, he says, why have you forsaken me? I want this to encourage you. He can relate. Verse 12 says, he who avenges blood is mindful of the cry of the afflicted. Jesus is shedding his blood, crying out, why have you forsaken me? So compared to verses 10 and 12, Jesus sounded pitiful. But compared to verse 3, Jesus seemed powerful. Look at verse 3. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. Scholar points out this is very similar to what we see in John chapter 18. They have come to arrest Jesus. He says, who are you looking for? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. And when they say that, Jesus responds saying, I am he. I want to remind you in Greek, he simply says, I am. And we're told that when he said that, they drew back and fell to the ground. They did what Psalm 9 verse 3 says the enemies would do. I want you to think of verse 3 and verse 12 as bookends. In verse 3, we see Jesus, this hint of Jesus being arrested. And in that moment, he displays a power that should have put everybody on notice. And yet, by the time we get to verse 12, we're hearing a hint of what he's going through on the cross, experiencing what it really feels like to be forsaken by his heavenly Father. And I want to speculate. We've got to be careful speculating. I just wonder, perhaps, perhaps Jesus, while hanging on the cross, wondering why he felt forsaken by his Father, perhaps he could look back to that very brief display of God's power and find some hope in the most hopeless of moments. I don't know that he did that. I'm just speculating, but I can say this confidently. We most certainly can look back on a display of God's power and find hope in our most hopeless moments. So for those of you who feel hopeless, I want you to know that we all can look back. We can look back when God has displayed his power in such a way that it can give anybody hope no matter what they're going through. In other words, we can indeed praise God and pray to God no matter what this morning. We see why in verse 13. I want you to see verses 13 through 16, the premise for our prayers now. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. Oh, you who lift me up from the gates of death. I want you to hear, do you hear a hint of the gospel? Oh, you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may recount all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation. Nations have sunk in the pit that they made. In the net that they hid, their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment the wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. I think most likely the most vivid Old Testament illustration of that last statement is found in the book of Esther. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. You may remember the story of Esther. The arch enemy was a man named Haman. and He wanted to kill Mordecai and so he designed and had built gallows upon which he intended to hang Mordecai, who was righteous before God. Haman is the one who ended up being hanged by his own gallows. The wicked was snared in the work of his own hands. The most vivid Old Testament illustration of that beautiful truth, the New Testament illustration, is the cross of Jesus Christ. When we think about Jesus hanging on the cross, we can imagine the devil thinking he's about to win, just eagerly watching what he thinks 
is the perfect unfolding of his plan against God. And all the while, God is watching things play out exactly as God has planned from eternity past, exactly as he sees fit, the wicked being snared in the work of his own hands. This is premised for our prayers. The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of David, is the very premise for all of our prayers. Be gracious to me, the very premise for all of our praise. Let me remind you, this psalm is tuned to the death of a son. And it's on that death of the Son of God that we can pray the way we see the psalmist praying. Be gracious to me, O Lord. We need God's grace. See my affliction from those who hate me. Lift me up from the gates of death that I may recount all your praises. Those are prayers that I want your spirit to be prompted to pray this morning. These are prayers that we can pray because of the gospel. Because God did ensure that his son would undergo death for you and for me. Listen, if, if you're not familiar with the gospel, you're hearing it right now. God the Father loved the world so much, he was not going to let the world remain forever under the power of the enemy. No, he sent his son into this world to die the God who avenges blood is the same God who sent his son to shed holy, perfect, righteous blood. And in that moment, the enemy thought he was winning and he wasn't. It was his doom he was watching unfold, proven when the son of God came out of the grave. When God lifted his son up from the gates of death. It's the power of the crucifixion and the resurrection. That's why we can pray. I want us to finish by seeing in verses 17 through 20, I want us to see two promises. I want to give you two promises that I hope will fuel your praise and fuel prayers, really beginning in just a few minutes when we just, when we get to sing again. I hope this will fuel your praise and prayers. I'm going to give you two promises and a concluding prayer from the text. First, let's see two promises. We find them in verse 17 and verse 18. The wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. These are two conclusive promises that David is able to put down as a result of the victory that has just been celebrated in the previous verses. The wicked shall return to Sheol, the grave all the nations that forget God and the needy shall not always be forgotten. The hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Here are two promises I want to fuel your praise and your prayers. Number one, the wicked will perish. And number two, the broken will endure. Maybe, and I say this sincerely, maybe, maybe some of you need to hear that first promise as a warning you're rejecting God, turning your back away from him, you're rebelling against him, number one promise, the wicked will perish. But I would imagine more people need to hear the second one. The broken will endure. Broken. I want you to think through your, your catalog. What do you remember in the gospels of people who are broken before God? You think of people who who are desperately in need of healing and, and the healing they, they, they know they need is an indication of deeper healing they really need, right? They, they come to him with leprosy, with fever, with demonic oppression. They experience a Jesus who has power over that in their brokenness and yet that leads them to a broader, deeper understanding of their real need for healing and salvation. You think of the the publican in Luke 18, broken, 
very much not like the Pharisee who's just so pridefully prayed in the temple. No, the publican is broken. He doesn't even lift up his eyes to heaven knowing he is so lowly before God, begging for God's mercy. That is a broken man. Jesus says that's the one that goes home justified. Or I think of Peter trying to fish all night, doing what he was already really good at, completely failing. And then Jesus says, try it that side of the boat. He says, fine, he does it. Miraculous catch. And what does he do? He falls to his knees before Jesus, who is able to do things more powerfully than he could ever imagine, who is able to infuse hope into the most hopeless situation. He falls before him and he says, depart from me, I am a wicked man. That's brokenness. The broken will endure. The wicked will perish, but the broken will endure. Let me give you this final prayer. It will inform my concluding prayer from verse 19 and 20, but there's adjustment. There's a slight adjustment. We see a prayer, I'm gonna read it, but then I'm gonna suggest that we have to adjust it just a little bit. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. I want us to pray this way, but we need to adjust it. We need to adjust it because we're in a different era of redemptive history. This arise, O oh Lord, this is hinting at the power of God to raise the dead, to come alive again. He's already proven that through his son. We now get to adjust that prayer. I'm going to suggest we pray, return, O oh Lord. Return, O oh Lord, let not man prevail. Let not the enemy prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear. Let the nations know that they are but men. And then we add a gospel, great commission prayer. Let them fear you and come to you by faith. We want the nations to know that our God sits on the throne forever. He is alive. He is coming back to reign for all eternity. That should inform our praise and our prayer. I want you to bow your heads with me. As your head is bowed, I do want you to listen to these verses from the New Testament before I pray. This is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I want you to hear verses 5 through 10. Paul writes this. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Heavenly Father, I pray that the gospel is being believed all throughout this worship room. God, grow our faith. And I pray that you will fuel praise among us. I pray that you will fuel prayers among us. God, I pray that right now that none of these friends, none of these brothers and sisters, they're not trying to hide from the conflict that they feel. They're not trying to hide from the pain or the trouble or the challenges even from some antagonism that they may be experiencing. Lord, we're not forgetting. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We know our true enemy is the devil himself. I pray that you will fuel our praise with this reminder that he has already been defeated. That his end is guaranteed, that his destruction is eternal. God, I do pray for those that, 
that need to respond to this gospel with faith, that they would be doing so right now, realizing in their soul that you are God most high, that you are to be revered as king, honored as judge, and we need your grace to do so. We thank you for providing your grace through your son, Jesus Christ, who died in our behalf and who was raised from the grave. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we respond to the word this morning? Marvelous grace of our loving Lord grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt yonder on calvary's mount i'll pour there where the blood of the lamb was spilled sing grace oh grace grace god's grace Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold. Threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold. Points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Oh, grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Oh, dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Oh, grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Let's sing that once more this morning. Oh, grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Church family, I want you to receive for your benediction the very next two verses from that passage I read in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. To this end, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.